KCB family. My name's Tracy. My name's Dave. My name is Becky Hartz. My name is Tim Paris. And my name is Jen Paris. I had been going through some really rough times. Ended up falling away from God completely, stopped going to church. I felt lost, I felt disconnected, and like my life just didn't have purpose. My friend Amy Hafer had invited me to come try out CCV. My friend Laura introduced me to CCV. My sister Amy was actually the person who invited me to come to CCV. I asked my husband to come along with me. She convinced me to go to church and try it out. The first time I came, I knew that this was going to be the place for me. The place was alive. You could feel the pulse. I started serving in youth ministry. I joined a small group and I even went on a missions trip. My mother, my sister, and I all were baptized on April 24th of this year. Together we were baptized in April of 2014. My life has completely changed since then and uh, I am grateful for it. Thank you CCV. Thank you Amy for inviting me. And thank you to Laura. Hey Amy, thanks for inviting me. I love that video. Uh, today I was going to talk about evangelism. And I ripped up my sermon, so I'm not going to talk about evangelism. Like, I literally ripped my sermon up this morning. I, in the, I felt that what I was about to say was nice, but would make no difference whatsoever. So, but I chickened out at the last moment and uh, started to preach my sermon that I had planned in the middle of first service and then just couldn't stomach it anymore. So I ripped it in half and I shared what I'm about to share with you. So what I felt like I was supposed to share when, when you think about evangelism, um, I wanted to make 10 confessions to you this morning. And I just want to say up front, uh, going to be a little uncomfortable. Uh, for those of you who are brand new, I'm not talking to you in any way, shape, or form. So, or just so we're clear, okay? Um, here's what I wanted to say, but chickened out, but I'm actually going to say anyway about evangelism and the confessions that I have to make about this. Number one, I don't evangelize. Uh, I don't evangelize, at least in the way it's typically presented. Um, and I want to confess this to you because my fear is, is that you feel guilty for not evangelizing. And so here's what I do. I build a relationship with someone and I never tell them I'm a Christian. Ever, I never tell them because in it, and inevitably they know I'm a pastor and then it gets weird because they start acting all holy and stuff around me. And so I just never tell them. I never tell them. And then 99 times out of 100, I kid you not, they bring it up every single time. And so my point, my goal is, is that I never make the first move. I never do. I just live consistently in front of them and try to live with joy, basically the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control against such thing. And there is no law, essentially, that will produce that. And the, what, what Paul is saying is that if you do those things, you will stand out like a sore thumb. Now, I've led lots of people to Christ, but very rarely have I ever, like, jumped into a conversation with someone at Wegmans or at Giant or wherever and just started talking about religious stuff. So I want you to know that the guy who serves you in this role doesn't do that. So if you don't do it, please don't feel bad or guilty or somehow you're like less of a Christian if you don't do that. Now I think we all need to impact people but you need to do it in the own unique way that God has equipped you to do that. And so if it's, just, if it's serving people, if it's building relationships, whatever it is that works for you, just trust that eventually God is going to open up that door. And then when he does, when it's natural and it's not weird or kooky, you can just tell people why you're a Christian and what it means to you. And then invite them to church. So I do pray for one every day. 
but I don't evangelize in the typical way. Number two, um, I want you to know that I struggle with my faith a lot. Like, a lot. And I know that I am supposed to be like a role model in terms of, wow, he's got this thing locked up, but I'm not there. There are parts of the Bible, when I read it, it makes me want to rip the Bible up and throw it away. There are passages that I don't understand. My prayer this morning was from Thomas Merton's book, Thoughts in Solitude. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going, but I hope the desire to please you does in fact please you because I have no flippin' idea where I'm going. I have way more affinity with Jesus' prayer in the Garden of, of Gethsemane remove this cup from me, or John the Baptist, after spending all of this time preaching about Jesus, and Jesus actually shows up, he sends him word, like, are you the one, or should we expect another? And I'm I'm like that a lot. And my fear is that somehow I have given you the impression that I'm not like that, and I would like to ask for your forgiveness, because this is how I'm wired. I see suffering in the world, I see injustice, particularly children suffering, and it really makes me mad and angry at God. And um, number three, I'm worried about our church. I'm, I mean, our church has got it together, which is why I'm worried about our church. I'm worried about our church and the way, you know how when you're, for those of you who are married, like in the early years of your marriage, like I always tell a story, Lisa and I, like we were so broke that we would eat fish sticks, macaroni and cheese, and then we would drink Kool-Aid, but oftentimes we didn't have enough money to buy the sugar to put it in the Kool-Aid. So it was just like flavored water. And I do that today. I drink flavored water. I'm like, this is awesome. And so we would go on a date every week to Big Boy, which if you're not from the Midwest, it's sort of a weird-sounding restaurant. The mascot out front is a big boy. He's a, he's a big boy. This guy's eating a lot of hamburgers and looks like me about a year ago. And big boy, and that's all we could afford. We would each get a big boy hamburger, and then we would split fudge cake. Now, obviously, now, now, that, um, now that I'm in my early 30s, I, uh, <laughs> I'm... But you, 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 you go through those early years where it, it creates drive in you, right? And you sacrifice, and then you get ahead. Some of you are in your careers, and you're, now you're making money. You've gone up the ladder. You have more responsibility. And what happens is it's like these golden shackles are put on you where all of the risk and the adventure, that, all, of, all of the dreams that you had earlier they're sucked away from you because you're, you're too far in your career to fail or do something different. You were made too much money to, to, to pivot. And, and I feel the way about our church that such amazing people and so many amazing things are going on. But what I long for is I long for the risk-taking where we put it all in Like, here's the thing. People are like, ooh, you're starting a second campus in King of Prussia. People have been starting campuses for 20 years. There's no risk-taking here. It is the exact opposite of risk-taking. We should have started a campus 10 years ago. 10 years ago. But we didn't. We were, me, we, two, two, two whatever. Number four, many of you are spiritually lazy. Many of you are spiritually lazy. God has blessed you immensely with incredible talent, with a heart for people. And you substitute impact with your life with walking into a building and then walking out and getting on with your life. Instead of asking, what is the cross that you want me to pick up? You let other people pick up the cross. This church is run by a small group of people who give virtually all of the money 
and do virtually all of the serving and do all of the leading and all of the sacrificing, when many of you are absolutely, utterly content with just walking in and then walking out. Which leads to number five. I wish I could quit. I wish I could quit. I don't want to quit, but I wish I could quit. Because I feel utterly incapable and unsuccessful at moving so many people at this church towards discipleship, towards actually being and living out the message of Jesus, obeying his commands, sacrificing, making Jesus the center of their lives and of their families and of their decisions and how they spend their money, how they spend their time, how they care for their bodies, the decisions that they make. And I just, I don't know what else to do. I blame it on lots of things, this area, some of the religious traditions that people have grown up on. I just know if I wasn't a pastor, my hope at least would be that I would be one of the people that would be sold out, that it rains last week, and it's not even a question whether I'm gonna stay home, because it's rainy and it's cold. And I want that for you too. Because what, is, what you're robbing yourself of is the incredible adventure of following Jesus every single day and the joy that it brings and the impact that it brings and ultimately the reward that you will experience when you stand before God and he says either, well done, good and faithful servant, or congratulations, you skated by. You did the bare minimum. I want to confess to you that I am inconsistent with Bible study and prayer, which is a shame because this is my flipping job. It's like talking to a guy who runs a golf course and who's like, I don't really get a chance to get out that often. You run a golf course. What do you mean you struggle? I'm inconsistent with Bible study and prayer. I do pray a lot. I do read the Bible a lot but I'm inconsistent, and my inconsistency troubles me. I bring this up because I want you to know that many of you, that I know that many of you, are inconsistent in Bible study and prayer, and you feel guilty in part because somehow I have given you the impression that I am consistent. And I want you to know that's simply not the case, that I struggle with it just like you do. I get bored with it just like you do. Number seven, I would like to confess that 300 years from now, I think the most important thing that we'll look back on as a church and say, wow, we really did, we nailed it there, is international missions. And I wish every single one of you had the resources or we could find the money as a church to send everyone in our church on a mission trip. Um, When Dan and I had an opportunity to eat dinner in the home of Avia, Avia is one one of five missionaries that we support full-time in northern India. You'll never meet them because they'll never come here and more than likely you'll never go there because there's a chance you could die. And that's sort of not the mission trip we want to have to call our insurance. Hey, we lost 100 people this time, but we're going next year. We'll do better next year, right? But so we're sitting there in, uh, in his home, and uh, I asked the stupid question, so how did you, how did you, how, where, who built your house? And he was like, well, I built my house. As if to say, well, surely in America, Everybody builds their homes, too. And I was like, well, of course we do, yeah. And he proceeded to tell me that he and his family went out to the jungle, cut down bamboo, brought it back, and built a house. His mother-in-law, 
mother on their deathbed because they don't have medicine, medicine that you and I take for granted, that all we have to do is call up the doctor, call us in a prescription, or can you get me in, or walk into any hospital, and they'll give you medication to stabilize you. His family dies. His family dies because of lack, lack of police protection, lack of medication, lack of clean drinking water, and there's nothing like being in the presence of people like that, that love God and have joy in their lives, to be able to make yourself look at your iPhone data cell phone plan and say, is that really an expense? Confession number eight, I worry about the kids in this church. I genuinely worry about the kids in this church because there are so many parents in this church that have their kids involved in endless activities and there's nothing wrong with having your kids involved in stuff. I'm talking everything from soccer tournaments to band to lacrosse to basketball to field hockey to, I mean, just help me out with the list, right? Brownies, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, I mean, every possible form of karate and jujitsu and every single possible thing and here's the thing your kid is not turning pro my kids are not turning pro well what they all have in common is they're going to stand before God and give account for their lives and we shape that and when one tournament misses, turns into six, six, six weekends away from church and a sub sort of commitment to children's ministry and student ministry and somehow our amazing volunteers and staff members in our student ministry and in our children's ministry, they're going to fix that in 52 minutes on a Sunday? Confession number nine. We're starting a new campaign as a church. Campaign meaning, if you're new, roughly every few years, roughly about every three years, we ask ourselves the question, God, what are you calling us to do as a church family? For the past three years and leading up to the end of this fall, we have been in a campaign called Exponential, where God has done some amazing things through that. But we've started praying a lot as, as leaders and there's a passage from the Bible that is really, really causing me to lose sleep. And it's this story in Luke chapter 7 where there's this guy named Jairus who is a synagogue ruler, a leader, which basically meant, it's all synagogue was, is basically if you take this seating section right here, that's about as many people that came to a synagogue. Just not a lot. Little homes, that sort of thing, turned into church building. And he ruled it, meaning more than likely he owned it and he cared for it and swept it up and get, got the animals out of it during the week and he took care of the scrolls and that sort of thing. If there was anybody that could have called in a favor with God, it would have been this guy. So he goes up to Jesus because he hears about how he's healing people and his 12-year-old daughter is dying. Some of you have had children in this situation. Some of you have family members. Some of you have lost children. And he goes up to Jesus and he says, I've heard that you're a healer. Can you please come to my house and heal my daughter? And he said, absolutely. And as he's making it a beeline to Jairus' house, hundreds of people just surround Jesus and won't let him pass, begging for Jesus to heal them and to do miracles in their lives. He spends the entire day dealing with the adults and helping the adults. Meanwhile, letting Jairus' daughter wither away. At the end of the day, Jairus comes back and says, I really appreciate the sentiment, but you're too late. She's died. He grabs him by the hand and says, I'll forget that, and then rushes to the house and he heals it. And I think our church right now is an awful lot like that story. Like, we have carpet in our children's building that's 10 years old. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of footprints 
on the piece of carpet that's 10 years old. It's crap. Our student ministry is completely and utterly overwhelmed. Our children's ministry, beside themselves, serving alongside these amazing volunteers. You want to know why? Because we don't have any administrative help. And you want to know why we don't have any administrative help? Because some of you don't give. That's why. Uh, but here's who it hurts. Your kids, our kids. Like, just back it up for a second. So, you have a kid in ninth grade struggling with depression, cutting, thoughts of ending his life, reaches out for help, can't get a hold of someone in our student ministry. Why? Because there's no person to answer the phone. Here's a girl who's in a decision. She's getting pressured to do something. Wants to reach out and wants to make contact, can't because there's no administrative help. That seems like a little thing, but it's not. And so we're calling this campaign Next Gen, our Next Gen campaign, where we're going to say, enough. For this season, we're going to put our kids first. We're going to give them the resources, the facility, the tools, the team, the support, the experiences, in order to put them first, we're going to put them at the front of the line. And we're going to do it not just here, but we're going to do it internationally as well. We're going to be starting new churches, some mission efforts. My prayer is that through this Next Gen campaign, we will double the number of children that are sponsored internationally. But here's my confession. My confession is, I just, is it just going to be like the same old people who serve and give every single time? Or will God be able to touch your heart? Here's the last thing, my last confession. My fear is, because we are such an evangelistic church, that many of you feel used by me in the church in general. Like somehow you're just a number. And like all that matters is more and more and more and more. As if like all I really care about is just to make the church bigger. I want to apologize to you. And I want you to know that what's in my heart, like let's say you're walking down the hallway and I'm not like the super warm, sort of extroverted person. You need to know what's in my heart. It may not be what's coming across in terms of like my facial expressions and who I am. I genuinely love every single person in this church. I wish, where are you, Matt? I wish I was Matt Silver. I wish I could just bob down the hallway and to have endless conversations with people. Love that guy. But I'm not. My... Um, my wife suggested this past week that I need to break out in terms of my, um, my uh, wardrobe. <laughs> and by the, by the laughs, you know what she's talking about. I'm like, what? She's like, you know, that you, know, you need some more variety. I said, what are you talking about? I, 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 I tried, it's just like, you know, when you go to Kohl's, like if you really like a shirt, hon, you will buy it, but then you won't get a different shirt. You'll just get the same shirt in seven collars. Like, <laughs> you keep throwing these shirts on, you look like an Oompa Loompa, you know? You just throw these on, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I see that. But where that's coming from is how I'm wired. And the way I'm wired is um, I'm introverted, and I like to... I like to create habits and structure in my life. And sort of like when Steve Jobs, he wore black shirts and jeans. To me, if I can just eliminate the decision of that kind of stuff. And, but I want you to know that I don't use the excuse of my introversion in any way, shape, or form to somehow excuse me from not being a loving person. And I, I just want you to know that just because you may not know me personally. 
or I may not be the super warm, fuzzy person that somehow meets you in the hallway and I brought my neighbor this way. Oh, they felt you're the greatest. And because I'm not that, I don't love you any less. You're not any less valuable, and I'm certainly in any way, shape, or form like worried about somehow like you're going to come and serve and evangelize and give that we're going to reach more people. I could care less about that. And I just want you to know that. Because I want you to know how valuable you are, how much I appreciate you. And whatever weird quirks and idiosyncrasies I have, you are deeply loved. Not just by me, but by our church. And that's all I got to say. I'll pray for us. Um, um, God, we, uh, we were, uh, you know we were planning on talking about evangelism today, but um, just want to let you know how much I appreciate the people that are in this room who are doing evangelism even when they don't even realize it, who are impacting people's lives even by not even opening their mouth. And um, I just thank you for them. Amen.